welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. I'd like to welcome everyone to another episode of On Finding Peace. And I'm your host, Chris Shea, and very pleased to have all of you joining us. This is the podcast where we talk about uh, practical tips for everyday living uh, toward our inner peace. And I like to talk about different topics and bring on guests who uh, you know, are struggling with finding that peace within themselves. And uh, you know, how can we learn from what they have already uh, you know, been able to learn and share some of their insights and wisdom with us. And on today's episode, I uh, am very pleased to have with us Dr. Zoe Shaw, and we are going to be talking about reinventing yourself, you know, looking at ways that we can change who we are and look at ways uh, of being a, a more peaceful person. Uh, so, Dr. Shaw, I appreciate you being here, and uh, can you introduce yourself to the audience and tell us a bit about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here. It's quite an honor. And yes, I'm Dr. Zoe Shaw, and I specialize in working with superwomen, so women who kind of self-identify of having a lot of roles that they're playing, which applies to most women. Um, and of course, a big one is, is overwhelm. And my goal is to help them kind of reinvent uh, themselves or reinvent whatever that term superwoman means to them and help them keep their mind in the game as they're juggling all of their balls. So, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's excellent. What I do. Excellent. Well, it is great to have you with us. And, uh, you know, I did find you through the social media and uh, your articles over on your tango. And, you know, I'm very impressed with uh, what you are doing. Um, can you kind of describe for us what is a superwoman in, in the way you're looking at it? Absolutely. So my definition of superwoman, woman, excuse me, would be a woman who is has more than one or two roles. So she might be a working woman. She might be doing going to school at the same time. She may have, you know, a marriage that she has to maintain and children. Um, various, you know, activities or various things that women try to do all at the same time. And it really goes back to the whole, I kind of think of it as, if you look at the feminist movement, right? Mm -hmm. There's some unintended consequences. So we have some blessings and we have some unintended consequences. And one okay. of the unintended consequences of the feminist movement is the creation of the superwoman. And in some ways that, you know, that was a positive thing and it was a very empowering word for women. Mm -hmm. And over time it actually became um, kind of a pejorative word in that, you know, it's no one can really have it all. And that's mm -hmm. what the realization, um, the, that's the realization that occurred over time. And so my um, role is to encourage women that yes, actually you can, you can have it all, mm -hmm. but not same time, which everybody knows, but you can do it in seasons. And so really helping women focus on seasons and their life and how they can mm -hmm. hyper-focus on one season so that they're able to accomplish things when they look over the course of their life, that quote, having it all. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, think that, that having it all um, unintended consequence Mm -hmm. Was that a result, do you think, of society in general shifting in, into, you know, more, having women more involved in, you know, the, the outside world, we'll say, you know, um, versus the women thinking they could be super women? Or do you think it was a bit of both? Or Well, I think it was a bit of both. Absolutely. I think women had um, an idea that, yes, we can do it all. We want to do it all. We mm -hmm. should to do it all and I think the do it all was we should be able to do things just as men do but the reality is is that even if you look at a household and you have a husband and wife doing 50 50 of the work right the emotional burden still falls on women and mm -hmm. so 
still are left with this idea of I'm doing more because we are. And it's just the reality of, you know, mm -hmm. men and women and our culture are really how we were designed. Um, and so, yes, it's a combination of society in general and women and what we thought we could do. Right. And you know, when you talk about that, the, the having it all thing, it's not even just the workplace because you've got the workplace issue where, of course, women should and want to be able to be valued equally as men and be able to do mm -hmm. the same work and, and um, have the same amount of compensation. But also our society has changed in terms of how we view our children. And so when we look at our children, our, our families are very hyper-focused on the kids, more so than they used to be. And so women have a greater burden to entertain our kids, to shuffle them everywhere, to do a million different activities. And there's this, you know, high performance uh, achievement culture as well. So it's kind of on both sides. Because even the, you know, housewife of the 1950s wasn't doing all these things with her children that now the working mom of the 2000s, you know, is doing. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and that's a very good point, because I didn't even think of it in that way. Um, I've always looked at it that when you combine, you know, kind of the household with the outside work, I, I like how you say 50-50, but speaking as a guy, it's not 50-50. Um, and uh, <laughs> that's nice, but that's not what it is. Um, but, yeah, I never thought of it, though, because I know when I was growing up, um, multi decades ago, um, yeah, we we didn't get shuffled all over the place. You know, I mean, if I was involved, you know, like one activity during the school uh, year, and in the summer I had one sport, mm -hmm. and that was it. I mean, the rest of the time you were home, you were roaming the neighborhood, you were, you know, doing what you needed to do, but you didn't need a parent to shuttle you to like three different things every single day. Right, and to hyper watch you either. I mean, kids can't, you know, play in their front yards, play in their backyards. Kids aren't roaming the neighborhoods anymore. That's neglect. So yeah. parents have to be more on top of things um, based on kind of what our, soul, our culture dictates. And mm -hmm. so we've got, you know, increased roles and responsibilities on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's really a, a big shock to me. I, I need to process that a bit more because no, I mean, really, because that does add a, add a whole different layer that, honestly, I never thought of. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I know many women who are single parents, and in my practice, I, I deal with some women who are single parents, and, you know, to understand how busy they are. But, yeah, I didn't even think about if we compare that same, say, single parent maybe 20, 30 years ago right. was a whole different you know, a world of how do you single parent. Mm -hmm. So we are adding that, that uh, you know, layer. What, what do you see often as part of the negative aspects of, of the superwoman? What, what's, you know, what's kind of bothering them and what, what are they coming to you with? I would say that the biggest aspects are overwhelm and guilt. And so then, of course, with that, we've got increased anxiety, increased depression. We've got, as well, just an increased general um, dissatisfaction with life and not mm -hmm. understanding why can't I get it all together? Why do I feel like I'm always kind of, you know, a million places and no matter what I do, I can't get it together. Those are, are kind of the general ones. And every woman who I've interviewed, um, as I'm working on, on a book about seasons, and I talk to them about what do you do for yourself? What do you do mm -hmm. for fun? What do you do for self-care? They will sometimes tell me something. Sometimes they can't think of anything. But no matter whether they tell me something or they don't, it always follows up with, but I feel guilty. Uh -huh. Which is, it's, it's amazing because even the thought of self-care makes them feel guilty because there's so many other aspects of their life that they have to take care of that they feel like they're taking away from that if they do anything for themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you see this similar, whether you're dealing with a single parent mother or a partnered, you know, mother? I mean, is that still the, the same response, even if they had help? Absolutely. I see it across the board. Yes. Interesting. Back to that, it's not 50-50, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> guys are going to hate me now. <laughs> Please, guys, don't send me hate mail. I'm not dissing the whole guy community here. <laughs> it's, it's not in any way about dissing men because we were made for that. Women are made to be nurtured and is accepting that and not feeling like this isn't the way it's supposed to be. It is. Mm. We have to figure out how we can still act in our nurturing self and accomplish all those other things we want in life and recognize that none of it can be done at the same time. So we have to look at those seasons. You know, there's a season for everything um, and not everything's going to get done in one season. <laughs> right. So I guess that's a good segue. When you said you're in the midst of writing a book on, on seasons, yeah. is that? Yeah, it's on seasons. And really um, I'm developing a seasons mapping program to Ooh. help them map the seasons of their life so that they can ultimately have it all and figuring out, you know, where you are and what you need to focus on. And a lot of times, you know, as we're going through life, we have this feeling that things are going to stay the same. You know, it feels like it's always going to be this way. Um, mm -hmm. And we get stuck in the same modes of behaving and the same modes of reacting without realizing that those don't really serve us anymore. Um, and so sometimes we can stay stuck in a season that we're not really intended to be in anymore and we're not accomplishing things that we want to accomplish. And so, yes, my book is really about understanding those unintended consequences, understanding the blessings of them, um, mm -hmm. accepting them and being able to live and move in the seasons of your life. So when you're talking with seasons, the, these could be multiple years of a season. Yes. So what, I'm hearing you saying is, is then we would work on a couple things that we can accomplish in those seasons, but don't try to accomplish all of it and try to figure out what do we postpone to a different season? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So have to be focusing on one or two priorities and those need to be your priorities during that season and recognizing how long should this season last? Mm -hmm. What should I be doing in the next season? Um, and it makes it really easy to say no when your priorities are very clear. And it makes you feel much less overwhelmed because you know that you're focusing on the things that you plan to focus on and you want to focus on. And, and I love that idea. I, I think men and women could do that and live more peacefully. <laughs> um, but uh, how difficult is it to really parcel out what I'm going to focus on in, in a season? Because there's a part of me, you know, that the intellectual part of me says, hey, this is great. I love this. This is perfect. Now, the, the other side of me is kind of saying, but I want it all now. You know, what, what, what's she doing telling me to wait a couple of years, <laughs> you know, in, in my life? I, I, I want to have it all now. Absolutely. And the reality is, is that life is what happens while we're busy making plans, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. true. But when you're trying to do it all now, you're losing any enjoyment in your present. You just are. And so it sounds good. And I want to have it all now too. I mean, you know, I'm a busy mom. Most of us are busy people and we do all want to have it now, but it's really about figuring out how do you enjoy your life? How do you enjoy the present? And part mm -hmm. of the way to do that is being able to segment it, being able to focus on the things that are important to you. And then you get to enjoy all those moments, not just, you know, just trying to grab, grab, grab and get it all. Right. So in, in this segmenting out that then, what might be a couple tips or, or ways that I can, I don't know what the right word would be. Do, do I suppress those other desires for now? Do I just lock them away for later? Like, how do I fill that gap or, or, or that, that's where my mind is, is right now confused. Right, right. Putting things aside. Well, I think a lot of it comes down to being able to recognize if the life you're living right now is serving your goals. So let's look at, for instance, and I'll answer that question to you later. Let's look mm -hmm. at you know, if your goal and you're in the middle of, let's say you're in the middle of kids in their middle ages, you know, and you're shuffling kids to a million different activities and mm -hmm. everybody's busy. But when you look at your parenting plan, which I think everyone should have one, it's like a business plan. And your parenting plan says that one of the things you really want to instill in your children is a sense of family and time together. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to McDonald's every day after school, dropping, you know, on the way to dropping them off at soccer, you really have to look at that. Is that in alignment with my plan? 
And so that helps you kind of make some of those choices about what you want to hyper focus on. And then do you put those desires aside? Absolutely not. You plan, you can think about them. And the other thing I, I like to think about is how much of our time do we spend sleeping in our life? Not enough, maybe. A third. Yeah, <laughs> the third. We spend a third of our life sleeping and we need mm -hmm. to, right? Our mm -hmm. body wouldn't function if we didn't do that. And I also think I like to talk about that with women because I think about, look, if you've got three priorities, right? One of them has to be you. Mm -hmm. and the third, focusing, and it doesn't mean you spend a third of your day on yourself, but you need to spend a third focusing on some self-care, focusing on goals, on things that you do want to do. Right. And then you have those other two thirds to nurture and do what you need to do in your life. Um, so no, I'm not saying you give up those goals. I'm not saying you even, you know, suppress them. But what you can find, what you'll find is that if you are making sure that you're making some time for yourself, you'll be able to start planning for those future seasons mm -hmm. so that when the time comes, you're going to hit the ground running. Very much in, into mindfulness. You know, mm -hmm. the, the topic that I, I speak often of and, you know, really enjoy the, the theories and, and different techniques with that. But yeah, and what you're saying sounds very much like that, where, you know, I'm going to use this present moment that I have mm -hmm. to prepare for that next moment. Right. Right. Yeah. What, what I also really enjoyed in what you were saying is, you know, when you said you, you run those kids to McDonald's and then you're off to the next thing, you got to set priorities. You know, one of the things that hit me was if we're setting the priorities for myself as, as the adult, it's mm -hmm. going to impact the kid, you know, in the sense of what maybe the priorities are, you're not going to do three activities in a day. You know, maybe we can only do one or two so that we can have family time after school. And, you know, so I, I guess we could even say, while we're working on this, we can teach our children Absolutely. how to do this technique at, at a younger age. Yes, without a doubt. And, you know, it's that, you know, Olympic star child is very rare, right? Mm -hmm. Those <laughs> Those situations exist and families have to sacrifice if that's part of their plan and that's what their goal is in their life. But like I said, those are very rare. So for all right. the other families, you don't really need to do that. Your kids can learn a lot of those skills you want them to learn, you know, with activities and, and other ways. And like you said, one sport instead of three. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to have the tutor and, you know, the extra class after school. You could maybe have one. Right. And, and I like that because maybe we can start promoting that into the next culture and then, or, you know, generation so that that generation that's popping up yeah. might already have it instilled in them that, you know, we don't have to do every single activity we want right now, mm -hmm. you know, and, and slow down. Because honestly, I don't, I don't know where this happened, you know, that, that switch from my growing up age, you know, to all of a sudden, the kids are just like overwhelmed with all of these pressures and things to do. And, you know, I mean, kids I see in, in my practice, teenagers, they, uh, they don't even know when to do homework because, you know, they finish school and they're off to the next thing, next thing. And, and they don't get home till nine or 10 at night, Absolutely. you know, and they haven't even done homework yet. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, a significant amount of stress, which is because of the competition as well. And yes, I don't, I don't know where that started in our culture either. I know it, it's kind of the underground, the, un, you know, the underlinings of that is the competition, is that drive to push our kids to succeed and be hyper mm -hmm. um, achievers. Even if you look at the school system, and this might be kind of taking a little loop, but <laughs> how kids, you know, back when I was going to, to high school, a 4.0 was really good. Mm -hmm. Now... No, you need to have like a 4.5, a 4.3 or 4 to think about even getting into an Ivy League school. You know, we didn't have it. So it's just, it's like it just has upped and upped and upped. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I do worry that we're pushing too much. I mean, I am not anti-education. I mean, I, I teach at two universities. I work in a high school. I, I, I'm not anti, but um, are we losing those other aspects of ourselves? You know, and, and I, I can see that, you know, that, you know, like you're saying, you know, we're pushing all these. When I was in school, we didn't have these AP classes, you know, where I could be in high school and yet be getting college credit for this. Yeah. When did we move college into high school and push these kids, 
high schoolers to do college work, you know, and um, I just found out uh, the other day, actually, that, you know, for uh, private schools, they have a uh, entrance exam, uh, you know, that an eighth grader will take to, you know, qualify for, do you know that they now have in some areas a pre-entrance exam? In the private that, school they do, really? For a seventh grader to take, to see where they need to build up so that they can do better come the real one in eighth grade. Yes, it doesn't surprise Like, me. really? <laughs> so now we're pushing this back to seventh grade. You're right. worrying about what I'm capable of doing to get into high school. I, I was even thinking about that this year because my son is in seventh grade and my mm. other son is a sophomore in a private school here. And I was thinking as he was taking his state testing, wait, they're going to be requesting this, these tests from seventh grade because we have to apply in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. So yeah, already you're starting to think, and, and my mind is like, okay, let me make sure I help them prepare. Let me make sure I let them know <laughs> that this one really counts because this high school, but I didn't do that. I was able to stop myself from doing that. But my initial kind of reaction was, oh, I need to push him, you mm -hmm. know, because this, this test is going to count. They're going to be looking at it. And this is how they do the placement for the AP classes. And if you don't get yep. certain grades, then all of a sudden you get on a different track. So yeah, it's, it, it's our culture. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know where it happened. It wasn't like that in, in my, the good old days. <laughs> um, you know, you took your high school classes and then you went to college if that's where you went and you took your college classes. Yeah. So I, I don't know what's going on, but I, I think though, to what we're talking about, I think though that that's where, you know, like when what you're saying, there's more on women to be the super women now, because mm -hmm. honestly, where does a lot of this test prep fall? Where, where does, you know, a lot of the, you know, well, if the kid doesn't make it, who do they look to first? You know, the kid for comfort, but also kind of, you know, oh, well, you know, didn't the mother help? Right. You know, I, I rarely hear them say, well, where was the father in the education process? <laughs> Yeah. You know, so I, I guess all of this in, in our culture is adding to that. But how do we, I guess, affect that change? I mean, how do we help people to, you know, get, get into this notion that, that we need to make a change because we're developing another generation and uh, it might be worse? Well, absolutely. It, it definitely could be. And I think it goes back to questioning yourself because, you know, a lot of the things we do, like I said, we just do out of rote and we don't think about it. And it goes back to questioning, does this really make sense? Is this really what I want for myself and my child? And is this going to get the end goal? Because, you know, just like with the sports, what's the end goal? What's the purpose? What are we trying mm -hmm. to accomplish? And so you need to ask yourself those questions. And a lot of times you'll find out, this isn't even going to accomplish what I want to accomplish. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. But then that becomes so countercultural because, you know, you can say that to yourself and then you can look at your child and say that, and then you've got all that culture that says, well, wait a minute, you know, you're going to be doing harm to the child if you pull them from this or don't have them do this or uh, how do we fight that? I, cause I agree with you. But how do we, you know, still think I, I can be super woman at this and, and yet be countercultural at this? Well, and it, it is going to take some of that strength. And there are women doing it. Absolutely. There are kind of, you know, movements that have started mm -hmm. in a slow way. Um, the homeschooling movement has been a part of that, too. Unschooling mm. is another part of that. Who, you know, moms, families who really see this is ridiculous and I don't want my child to be a part of this craziness. Not that I don't want my child to achieve, but I don't think that right. that's the only way to do it. Um, but it really takes a strong person. It takes somebody who's willing to, to not necessarily go with that flow. Mm -hmm. So is, is that going to be part of what's in the book or is that what you do in your work as well when working with the women help with that strength? Well, the strength is definitely part of, of the book because it's really about finding your strength and reading mm -hmm. whatever that means to you. Because as women, just like you said, it's like if everyone's trying to go with the flow, you're not being authentic to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. 
term superwoman has, you know, this connotation of you should be able to do all these things, but what does that really mean? And you have to make it personal to yourself and unique. So yes, the strength aspect for sure. In terms of, in terms of like going against um, and our parenting, my book's not really necessarily about that. It's really focusing on the woman and her figuring out, you know, her seasons. Mm -hmm. Right. No, that, that uh, makes sense because once, you know, the woman understands that, I think the other stuff would probably begin to fall into place. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. definitely. So when we look at seasons and you're talking about going from one season to another, right. how do you make that transition? How do we change from season to season? You know, let one go, bring on the other one. What, what is that change process like? Well, it's different for everyone. I can tell you kind of what it should be like and what the ideal would be like. Mm -hmm. um, but for the majority of us, like I said before, we don't recognize when it's time to change. Mm -hmm. um, and so really it, it's about being aware that it's time to change, that things have mm -hmm. changed in our life because nothing ever stays the same. Right. Um, and so then often there's dealing with it because you might, if you're looking at changing, like big changes, like empty nests, like getting married, like having children, those are significant life changes that can kind of mm -hmm. rock, you know, rock your boat. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so if you're planning for them, then you can make the change a little um, less jarring. If mm -hmm. you're not planning for them, and sometimes you can't, a spouse dies, boom, you've got a big season change right there. Yeah. And then it's time to, to really start reevaluating. Um, one of the things that I like to do with my clients is help them understand that the words that you say to yourself, of course, are so powerful. And the way mm -hmm. that we walk through and experience our life is predominantly um, um, about and predominantly influenced by the story we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about maybe a jarring life change or even one that you know that's coming up like an empty nest or, or a death. Um, when you look at the words that you tell yourself, the story about how this change happened or why it's happening, and if it's predominantly negative, then you're probably going to have a negative experience. Mm -hmm. um, if you can look at it in a different way and tell yourself a different story that is still realistic, then you're going to have a different experience. So it's kind of staying focused on the, pre or on the positive it's versus a negative aspect. Yeah. If, if we're looking at everything can have, and I'm using these terms loosely, but if, if every situation can have a positive and negative outcome, are we focused more on that positive versus focus more on that negative? Absolutely. Absolutely. Positive and realistic because sometimes right. we, I'll use, you know, the therapy term catastrophize, you know, we <laughs> make up these whole, you know, horror stories about what's going to happen or what is happening. But mm -hmm. if you look at the present, right. And I say, always take two hands, put them beside yourself on the ground or couch or bed and ground yourself and ask yourself, how am I right now? What's going on right now? Am I okay? Um, and then what's the story I can tell myself about my husband leaving? You know, I can tell myself mm -hmm. I'm unlovable, that, you know, I'm never going to have happiness in my life that, you know, a million negative things, or I can right. say, you know what? It sucks that he left. I wish he would have stuck it out, but I'm going to develop so much strength as a result of this. And I am lovable and I'm going to find love again. Mm -hmm. It's going to change the way that you walk through that season. Uh, exactly. And what I like is, you know, like what you're saying, this is realistic. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've found is even if in, you stay realistic, but don't yet believe it, mm. if you keep telling it to yourself, you can affect that change within yourself. So uh, again, like you emphasize, keep it realistic, mm -hmm. you know, but in like what you're saying, you know, I, I, I can find love again, you know, I mean, there might be some who are saying, well, yeah, that's realistic, but that ain't going to happen. But if you keep telling yourself that, mm -hmm. right, stay on that positive bent. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because the mind doesn't know when you're lying to itself or not. It doesn't, but right. it acts based on what you tell it. Our mm -hmm. bodies know. And so when you're lying to yourself, our bodies know, and it actually creates that 
uh, that incongruence and can actually create sickness, right? Because our bodies can tell, but our minds don't know. And so you tell yourself something positive, your mind's going to react in that way and act on yep. it. Tell yourself something negative in the same. Exactly. And, and I appreciate you bringing that up because I, I don't think a lot of people know that trick. Mm-hmm. You, you know, it's, you know, we can tell our minds what we need to tell our minds and it goes with it, you know, and uh, I think, you know, those who don't really believe that, I think they should try what you're saying. <laughs> um, but also think, you know, if they've had traumatic experiences, you know, what did they tell themselves to get through it? Yeah. And why is it that you believed what you told yourself? Mm. You know, so it, it does work. So if it works in that traumatic experience, why would it not work when I say, hey, I'm lovable and I'm going to find love again? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome to keep focused on, on that positive. Mm-hmm. Do we ever know that we missed that change in that season? You know, you, you were saying earlier that sometimes we don't know it's time for that change or time to move it into the next. Are, are we then just stuck? I mean, how, how are we going to pop into that next one if we're, we've missed that transition period, let's say? Well, I think it, it often happens that people realize later, you know, that they've missed that season. I've had clients that have come in, you know, women and, and even men in relationships or in their families or work and, and they'll talk about, you know, I was doing really well. I was working towards my goals. And then all of a sudden I woke up 10 years later and realized what happened, you know, where mm-hmm. am I? And am I, you know, this isn't even the life that I want. So yeah, that's somebody who's definitely missed a season, Um, but it's never too late. It's never too late. You can always, as long as we're alive, go back, reevaluate your goals and figure out how to reinvent yourself. Right. Yeah. But yeah, Yeah. it's definitely true that that you can miss it or or miss the signs that things need to change. Mm -hmm. But whenever you do realize it, then like you say, then redo your goals and now move forward. I mean, it's, yeah, you know, so, and and I like that term that reinventing oneself, you know, because it's really not putting you down. It's saying, you know, you are still you and now this different person. I I don't know what the word would be, but. Yes. You're still, but you're, you're acting and living in a different capacity and, you know, we're living longer than ever. And, there's no way that you can be the same throughout your life because your life is different over time. Mm-hmm. You that same and you're not growing. Um, and so it's important for men and women over time to reinvent, to reevaluate and reinvent who they are and what they want to be to look at those goals. Because sometimes we have really great goals, but you know, 20 years later, life circumstances have changed and you know, we need to look at our, are those goals serving me? I mean, you look at life insurance, you might get life insurance when your kid's, you know, two, and then, you know, your kid's 30, and do you really need that same coverage? Right. (laughs) The same kind of thing. It depends. Are they still living at home? (laughs) Uh, 30 year olds these days. Um, So, uh, as we kind of come to the end, end of, you know, our time here, is there anything that we haven't covered or, or any way you would want to, you know, sum up what, what we've talked about? Hmm, good question. <clears throat> well, I think a couple things. When it comes to reinventing or, or changing your life, there's like a couple little points that you just want to make sure you're always doing because sometimes that's, that reinventing can be stressful. And mm-hmm. so during those stressful periods, you want to do things like pay attention to things you can control because sometimes you know, there's so much going on in your life that isn't in control, that it's okay to kind of attach yourself to some of the things you can control for a while. Um, You definitely want to prioritize rest. Um, You want to ask for help. So if you are feeling overwhelmed and overloaded, then it is time to ask for help. You can ask for help if you have a great circle from friends. Mm -hmm. Specific. Don't just say, hey, you know, you know, friends will ask, can I help you? Well, no, say, yeah, I need a babysitter Friday at seven. Right. You know, I need these things. Ask for help when you're feeling overwhelmed. Um, And if you don't have that circle, then create one. Find a therapist. Find circles of people who are in similar situations that you Mm -hmm. are. And the other one is learn. When you Mm -hmm. enter a different season, you've got to educate yourself on that. You know, if you're an empty nest, 
hear things that you haven't even thought about that pertain to that. So you always want to be educating yourself for the next season that you're going into. Mm -hmm. All wonderful points. And, and I really just want to reemphasize what we kind of started with. And you said, you know, over and over that self care, you know, we really need to spend time to take care of ourselves and uh, all too often we're the last ones. Right. So uh, yeah, really spend that time and taking care of oneself so we can be fully present and able to, you know, be the person that we are to everybody else, mm -hmm. you know, you so put it on your calendar. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Don't just say you're going to do it. Actually put it down and then do it. <laughs> Make an appointment for yourself, just like you do everything else in your life. Mm -hmm. Very good. So uh, if people want to learn more about you or get in touch with you, what is the best way for them to do that? Um, you can find me on all social medias at Dr. Zoe Shaw, D-R-Z-O-E-S-H-A-W. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. That is also my website, drzoeshaw.com. You can mm -hmm. find me there. Yep. Excellent. And yeah, I encourage people to uh, investigate all that. And, you know, your website has a lot of good information. So, uh, you know, definitely have people uh, get on that. And um, I'm intrigued. So I, I blog as well. And I also do individual therapy and individual coaching. And I also have some groups coming up as well for, for women. Excellent. And I look forward to that book. A any idea when that might come to I'm fruition? I'm in the stages of the proposal. So it, it will be a little while, but I'm okay. really excited as I'm starting the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm, and I'm excited about the whole topic and, you know, we'll, uh, we'll have to have you back when that gets out Great. to uh, see how it all turned out and, you know, what other insights uh, you've gained throughout that process. So yeah. that, that'll be great. Um, so thank you for your, you know, your time. And I really appreciate you coming on the show and, uh, you know, sharing the tips that you share and, you know, the insights that you gained. And I know I've learned some insights and uh, especially in how women nowadays versus 30 years ago. Um, yeah, I gotta, I gotta ponder that one a bit more. <laughs> um, my, my deal with my clients a little bit different now. Wow. So, yeah. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I really Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.